Uh, take two. Part of you doing that right in your face. So I just start the answer again? Yeah. yeah. I would say that there certainly are some differences between myself and mainstream libertarians. Mainstream libertarians are very interested in the idea of the state as a valid social entity that should be kept as small as possible. Uh, this is the founding father idea that the government should be life, liberty, and property, or life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So the government uh, is governs best, which governs least, that there's a good role for government in three major areas, which is uh, the defense of persons and property, the police force, and so on courts to adjudicate and perhaps prisons to, to punish. There certainly are some differences between myself and the mainstream libertarians. Mainstream libertarians view the government as not just valid but essential for the good order of society. So in major areas, three major areas that libertarians promote the use of government. First is in um, the, uh, the, the police force, uh, to law, legal and police system to protect persons and property. Courts to adjudicate disputes, perhaps prisons. There's some Private, public or private prisons, there's mixed opinions on those, but prisons to punish and national defense, military uh, and so on, to defend the region. And that is the mainstream approach. So what they're interested in doing is returning the government back to its constitutional roots and to get rid of all of the extraneous stuff that started with Fabian Socialism in the early part of the 20th century that was really sort of supported and, and fed by the fiat currency creation made possible through the centralized banking through the Federal Reserve and which really blew up during the Great Depression through massive government intervention in the economy and then the government got even bigger of course uh, during the Second World War when it took over most sections of the economy and then it collapsed, of course, quite a bit at the end of the Second World War for about 10 or 15 years. And then, you know, they got huge again with the welfare state and the entitlement programs under Lyndon Johnson's Great Society. And then you had the EPA and, the, and OSHA in the 70s. And I don't go on. But it's really grown. I mean, the federal government is five to six times larger now than it was you know, 20 or 30 years ago. And so for most libertarians, the problem is the government has gotten too big. And that's not my particular perspective. Um, my particular perspective is you know, I'm a philosopher, I'm a moralist. I come from it from first principles, not from what seems to make sense or, you know, what has worked for at some point in the past. I come from first principles. Non-aggression principle means you can't have a state because the state is by definition a monopoly of people with the right to initiate force in a geographical area. You can't get around that. Uh, you can't put magic into the solar system. You can't put a finger of God somewhere in physics and say, here's where the magic happens, where we can reverse the rules. Uh, the non-aggression principle and self-ownership and property rights means that you can't grant people the right to violate the non-aggression principle. You can't grant people the right to violate personal property through taxes and tariffs and regulations. You just can't do it. And so most libertarians would say, you know, we want freedom and the best way to have freedom is to have a, a, a small government. From a principle, and I'm not saying that the libertarians aren't principled, but when my approach from really first principles, take no prisoners, don't compromise, is we have to find a way that we can make the case for a stateless society, which is completely bizarre to people. It's like saying, I want to repeal gravity. I mean, because this is what we've always done in societies. But major human institutions of oppression have been eliminated in the past. I mean, there used to be slavery. Now, not so much. I mean, we could say it's transmogrified a little bit, but formal human ownership has been banished from the West. Women used to be not even second-class citizens. Um, now women have, fortunately, rights equal to men. We do make major changes in human institutions that have been around since humans have been around. And the state would seem to me just another one that we need to challenge. And I think there's many, many examples of how you can run things beautifully without a state. Look at eBay. eBay has 350,000 employees. It's the largest employer uh, in the world. And there's no state. I mean, it's, there's no way to adjudicate disputes using the court system uh, in any practical way through eBay. It's all over the world. It's anonymous. But it runs beautifully. Uh, so there's lots and lots of examples. Half the world's workers, and this is truly tragic, half the world's workers operate outside of a legal framework. They operate in the gray market or the black market. They have no access to a legal framework. Now, that's not what would happen in a truly free stateless society. In a stateless society, you would have access to a framework of dispute resolution. These people are specifically denied access to a monopoly on dispute resolution, and yet they actually manage to get things done in a fairly effective way. So again, there's tons of examples of how you don't need a state. Even if the state bans anything else from solving the problem, the problem still gets solved. If the state wasn't banning things like alternate ways of resolving disputes, if the state wasn't banning uh, other ways of defending yourself against aggression than having you know, massive military and, and aggressive foreign policy, there's so many solutions that could come into play. 
And so I am enormously encouraged by the fact that people even can get things done without a state around. Even if the state is interfering with things, they can still get things done. If there was no state and all the problems and solutions could be out in the open, I think we'd get things solved very quickly. But that, of course, is where a big difference is between myself and mainstream libertarians. And, you know, we're engaged in that debate on a, on a continual basis. Um, of course, one of the results of that is that if you believe that the state is valid but needs to be shrunk, then you're more drawn towards using political activism uh, to try and manage the state back down to some smaller size. I'm not a big fan of political activism. I think that it doesn't actually achieve what we want. We've poured, as a movement, hundreds of millions of dollars into it. We've poured at least four decades into it. And the government is monstrously bigger than it was when we first started. So I have, you know, I always go back to the data. I'm just an annoying empiricist that way. Uh, is it working? No. Maybe there's another way that's hasn't been tried, that could be tried, but uh, it hasn't worked yet, and so I sort of look for alternate ways to try and foster a more free society. Okay. And um, again, what, what you see is, a, is, is something that everybody that seems to hold, one, one or two, like a quick sort of sound bite that, that um, among all of the, the people that are, let's say tonight, that are going to be uh, on taking stage or in the audience, what you seem to see sort of consolidates them all together. Well, it is a, a desire to be free. It is a desire to be free. With freedom comes responsibility. It's true. It's an old caveat. <laughs> it's, it's, the, it's the fine print of freedom is responsibility. And I think everybody in the audience has had an experience with authority that has been negative, that has been destructive, that has been problematic. And we yearn to make decisions that are peaceful without being aggressed against. I think that is the, the, the dream that human beings have as a whole. I don't, get to, I don't have the right to make the decision to strangle some guy. I mean, because that, that's, you know, that's imposing my will on his in a violent way. But where I'm making a decision in my life that is not aggressing against anybody else, I yearn to have the freedom to make that decision. And I'm willing to accept the consequences if that decision goes badly. But I want to finally be an adult. You know, I feel like in our society, you're never allowed to grow up. I mean, as a kid, you're told to go to school and you're told what to learn, you're not given many choices, and then you go to college where you're given curriculum and courses, and then you go into the workforce where you're told what to do, and then you've got all these regulations and laws and controls, and you're told what to do, and there are, the tax code is like three and a half million words long, and there are, I think last year there were 4,000 new regulations that came down that people have to obey, and it's like you're never allowed to make a peaceful decision that has no negative impact on somebody else. You're never allowed to make that decision as a free and sovereign adult. We're never finally allowed to grow up. We live in this Peter Pan world of micromanagement by everybody. And I just want to drive people back and say, I want to be free to make my own decisions. I'm willing to accept the consequences of those decisions, but I am a 45-year-old adult, well-educated, intelligent, articulate. I can make my own decisions, and I really insist upon the right to be allowed to make those decisions free of force. And I think that just about everybody in their heart of hearts wants that. 